Hi, my name is John Dockery. I'm the president and show manager of the Photographic Historical Society, and we're here today at our Photographica show, which we run twice a year in lovely downtown Wakefield, Massachusetts. And what we're doing here is we've got about 70 to 80 tables full of dealers who are trading in what now is called analog photography, meaning non-digital photography. Uh, these are speed graphics, 4x5s, uh, view cameras, twin lens reflex cameras, as well as collectible cameras and images. We have a very brisk business when one considers that we charge money for you to come into this hall and the economy is not doing very well. And by all things, things in particular, what's going on here is the fact that, well, and this is pretty much ancient technology. Um, no, no, it's amazing to us that the young people are really getting involved in it and really happening to kind of come back to it. We're hoping this is the vanguard of the youth movement because we're getting a lot of old and gray-haired people who are playing with all the photography equipment of their youth. But we see a lot of young people coming in and a lot of interest in this material. So hopefully we will we'll continue. We are in our 77th show. We have plans for our 78th show. Next year will be our 80th show. So we've been doing this for almost 40 years. We're pretty psyched about this. And the attendance is actually going slightly up. So please stop by and say hi. We'd love to meet you. We have a lot of people asking a lot of questions about this equipment and the merchandise. Thanks so much. Come in and enjoy the show. My name is Marty Jones and I come from Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm a collector of cameras for 33 years. I collect colored cameras, toy and novelty cameras, and sub-miniatures, and unusual commemorative cameras such as scouting, World's Fair type cameras. I have about 800 cameras in my collection, and I've met so many wonderful people through collecting from all over the world. My senior year in college, I had taken all the credits necessary to graduate, so I took a photography course because I had taken one in high school and really enjoyed it, and the professor brought in a sample of a daguerreotype and a tintype, and I thought that would be really interesting to put on a table with an old camera. So I went out and started buying cameras and some old photos at that time, and pardon the pun, but I had to decide what I wanted to focus on. And so I uh, narrowed it down to what type of cameras I wanted to collect. And I've uh, been joined this organization probably at least 25 years ago and met so many wonderful people, as I said before. And it's given me an opportunity to add to my collection and upgrade from what I did have. My favorite is a camera made by Kodak in the 1920s and it was called the Kodak Ensemble and it came with a matching lipstick and rouge for women with a mirror in the case so you could prepare yourself for the photo by putting the makeup on. So this is very similar to the one I just mentioned that's my favorite um, made by Kodak in the 1920s marketed to women it came in different colors um, the one that with the matching lipstick and rouge that I mentioned happened to come in green, pink, and beige and it folds up into the case, very compact. They were called also vest pocket and they would fit in a pocket. Um, and the woman was able to put her makeup on as I indicated before the, the photo was taken if she needed to freshen up a little bit. Charlie Tuna was made by White House Products back in 1971. It took a 126 cartridge film and in order to um, get this camera, you had to send in a certain amount of tuna fish labels, and then you'd get the camera. So can you imagine walking down the street, taking a picture, holding your big Charlie tuna fish? So it's an unusual novelty camera to have, but it's part of my collection. Another part of my collection are miniatures. Um, this is called a hit-type camera. 
They came a lot of times in carnivals back in the 60s and early 70s. They came with a variety of names around them, so the ones with different names are harder to get. Um, so they came in a little case and a very, very tiny roll of film. So I have about uh, 80 different ones with different names on them at home. But it was a little bit smaller than 16 millimeter, so almost... 9.5 I think it was 17 millimeter it was called. I've never, it's a very unusual size. But a lot of people take 16 millimeter and they cut and roll it themselves. Hi, I'm Roger DiGilio. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. And I've been collecting cameras uh, for about 20 years. Uh, for the last uh, eight or nine years, I've been dealing with collectible cameras, mostly in those uh, made before 1910. And I've been to the Boston Camera Show here in Wakefield, sponsored by the Photo Historical Society of New England, for the past five years. It's a great show, probably one of the best in the United States. Today I brought up a number of very collectible cameras uh, that have appealed to a series of collectors that attend the show and others that have appealed to younger individuals who actually like to take the antique cameras and use them. It's not easy, but it's not too difficult, particularly if you have a very uh, competent instructor, as these young women clearly did. Cameras of note that I brought to the show this year included a Blair Lucidograph, which was made about 1885, which was made in Boston by Blair Camera Company, which was one of the earliest folding plate cameras made in the U.S. for dry plates. This is the Blair Lucidograph I talked about a little earlier. It has a lens in the front on a lens board. It goes up and down, and there is a bellows that allows the camera to move in and out on the track. Either track that allows you to focus. And the back of the camera has a brown glass screen for focusing. The plate holder uh, for the plate uh, fits in the camera right here, ahead of the ground glass screen. So, with this camera in 1885, 1886, when you were ready to shoot, you had the lens cap on the lens, pre-focused it, sitting on a tripod, you put the plate holder in the back, remove the cover over the plate holder, then uncap the lens and count the number of seconds you thought would be necessary to make the proper exposure. Put the cap back on the lens, put the sheath back on the holder, and that would have made your exposure. You could then move the holder to the cap. A complicated process, but a big advance over what they used in wet plate era, which ran from the 1840s up until the 1880s. My name is Dick Coolish, and we have a group here that's called Stereo New England. And what it is is a, a local club of people interested in 3D photography. So we have two different setups here. Uh, one is a slide setup with two slide projectors, and the fellow who does that uh, uses two uh, Nikon single lens reflex cameras to take two pictures on uh, two rolls of film and he puts each picture in, a, in one of the slide projectors and then he projects the images through polarizers onto a screen and you do with polarized glasses. And on the other side is a digital setup 
that essentially does the same thing. The image comes out of a projector and it gets split into left and right images and it's run through two digital projectors. And again, you wear polarized glasses. Okay, my name is Dave Wilson. I'm a member of this uh, local club, Stereo New England. We're, we're a group of guys who are interested in shooting 3D. And we all uh, take lessons from each other and learn how, how better to do it. The two projectors are mounted like this on a baseboard for th probably three reasons. One is to get the two optical axes as close together as possible and avoid keystoning on the screen. Secondly, I can converge the two pictures by moving this bar here, which has a mirror on the end, by turning this knob without moving the projectors. I can co you know, coincide them on the screen. Thirdly, it's easy to get at the slide trays. One's not on top of the other, so I can get at the slide trays. And, uh, I don't know, fourth, it's, it's easy to take apart when I'm done. I can just lift the projectors off the board. So, there was a reason for it. These are polarized glasses for looking at stereo pictures on a screen. The projector has two polarizers and the silver screen over there preserves the polarization. So when you put these polarizing glasses on, each eye sees its own image and therefore you see 3D because to see 3D, each eye has to see its own image. The two images are, of course, slightly different for the two eyes. Here, here's where the two polarizers crossed and here's where them lined up. You'll notice if I'm lined up on this one, I'm crossed on the other one. So these, the two polarizers in the glasses are 90 degrees to each other. And here's crossed, uncrossed. Got that? When we look at a distant scene with our eyes, a point at infinity, our lines of sight are parallel all the way out to infinity. So if we're shooting a pair of pictures to be viewed in 3D, and we're going to project them on a screen, Okay, in this frame, the two projected frames in the camera, which were off-center, converge at some distance right in front of the camera. That's called the stereo window. <clears throat> if something in your scene is at the stereo window, it'll be the same place in the two frames. And you can see that here because the walk at, the, at its nearest end is basically the same in both frames. But something that's far away in the scene will be at a different place in each scene because your, your line of sight to that point should be essentially parallel from each eye. And so the walk here illustrates that geometry. And this is, this is true of any 3D picture. If it's shot properly, it, is it basically this geometry is built into it. Once you look at it with the glasses and each eye is seeing its own picture, you don't see this. You only see it if you look at the picture or the two pictures simultaneously. This mirror, which helps us align the two projectors to each other, is mounted on a, an arm, a plastic arm here with a pivot, and there's a screw and a spring which allows us to turn the mirror by a very small angle, which allows us to properly align our two frames on the screen. Okay, well here, here on the screen we have two test patterns, which right at this moment are just about on top of each other, so you can't see them, but I'm going to purposely misalign them. And what we, we can also see here is one of the projectors is not focused properly. Now I'm going to put them, put them back into alignment, they go right on top of each other. And I'll, I'll, go off, I'll go out of alignment the other way. Here we have a, what's called in the stereo trade, a twin rig. That's two cameras synchronized in order to take stereo pictures. And what I've used here is a couple of Nikon N2000s of about 1985 vintage. And they're mounted in a, a fiberglass frame. And the one camera is upside down compared to the other one. And the reason is to get them as close to, together as possible and also so that the film doors uh, don't get in each other's way. <coughs> These cameras are equipped with a with a electrical triggering jack, which is maybe hard to see on the front here. But the two triggering jacks are wired together 
to a triggering box, which allows me to fire off both shutters at the same time. The zoom lenses are connected by little cables in here, by little tiny uh, stainless steel cables, and they're uh, connected to a drum that I work with my left hand, and I can zoom both lenses together. And uh, let's see. The focus rings are also, focus rings on the lens are also connected with a cable so I can focus them simultaneously. <clears throat> I'm left eyed so I look through the left camera and I've covered up the right viewfinder so the sunlight won't get in and foul up the light meter. And uh, I don't know, what else can I tell you? There's a, there's a remote triggering jack here, presently covered up, so I can shoot night shots with long exposures. And there's a tripod socket on the bottom, too. And there's a level on the bottom so I can hold the camera up over my head and, sh and sh up at arm's length over my head and shoot over a crowd, over the heads of a crowd. And I guess that's about it. Okay, here's the camera in shooting position. We can, we can zoom in and out with the left hand. We can shoot with the right hand. We can focus using these two fingers. We're, we're good to go. My name is Ruud, Ruud Hof, and I'm uh, from Europe, from the Netherlands. I have been a uh, professional photographer uh, for 35 years, for uh, working for an international news agency. I've traveled all over, and during my travels, I, uh, I have accumulated quite a collection of early cameras. Um, whenever I had a chance to go to a flea market in a foreign city, I did. And um, I have a large collection, uh, mainly Kodak. Other people say I have the best Kodak collection in the world in private hands. The early Kodaks, of course, are my favorites. Uh, they date back from uh, 1888, when um, George Eastman made his first camera. And the camera was named the Kodak. And because of the popularity of the Kodak, the, um, the name Kodak uh, became part of the company name. So we changed it in Eastman Kodak Company, which is still uh, the name in use now. Unfortunately, the company isn't doing too well, like the other major companies. This is the very first, this is a, a model of the very first Kodak. Um, uh, George Eastman had a slogan, you press the button, we did do the rest. So this camera came with a roll film in it. You could take uh, 100 pictures and by um, pulling the shutter and pressing the button. When the camera was full, uh, you returned the whole camera to the factory. And for... Um, Ten dollars, you got a new film and a hundred prints. I have images and I have stereo equipment that I also like. The stereo um, became very popular in the 1850s, and um, there are millions and millions of scenes in stereo has been produced, and they came in all different sizes. This is a uh, British one. Here's another one from England. But there are also cameras and images from France, like this one, it resembles a binocular. And it has a different small format of um, views, it's like this. So they came in uh, all different varieties. Another thing that's interesting is um, optical amusements, optical toys, like um, for magic lanterns. These are from France. They came in a, in a box like this. And um, it's quite heavy and breakable, but they're very collectible. Some people uh, play with it at home. They have a projector and then they project it on the wall and 
it's fun uh, when you have children, they, they love that kind of thing. And all these um, optical amusements, they were part of the development of movie film later and after movie film, um, television of course.